And now we're going to start with our guest speaker who's online because she hasn't been able to be here with us. She's in Budapest. As you know, the, and our speaker will speak in English, so you will be able, if you want to hear her presentation in Catalan, you have to use the interpretation devices. I don't know if everyone uh, who needs have the device. And without further ado, we'll give the floor to uh, the speaker. Fernanda, everything is ready. Good morning, Professor Barr from Budapest. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much um, for this uh, invitation and the initiative. I'm very happy to speak here. I would be even happier if I could be there in Barcelona today. And I hope that one day this will also be possible. First of all, before uh, starting my talk, I would like to congratulate um, the Foundation, the University of Barcelona uh, and the Solidarity Foundation for this initiative. Uh, this might be humble, but it's also pioneering because indeed uh, there are not too many uh, conferences, not too many events, even those dedicated to subaltern memories that are including uh, persons with disabilities. So I hope that this is going to be followed up. This is very important because uh, the struggle for the inclusion of persons with disabilities goes hand in hand with an academic struggle of historians uh, to write the history of persons with disabilities. And this has to be done. And also the memorization has to be done with the inclusion of voices uh, of persons with disabilities, hence the title of my presentation, Nothing About Us Without Us. And so in this talk, uh, I have two aims. I would like to show a few existing practices of memorization from the 20th century. And in the second part of my talk, I will suggest a new theme for memorization and that is the social movement and the protest movement of persons with disabilities. However, before I start showing some of the slides with photos, um, I would like to pose the question, why is this memorization happening so late in comparison to other marginalized groups? And there are several reasons for this. Um, I would like to mention the following ones. Disability is a very heterogeneous category. You know, there are, dis there are uh, persons with cognitive disabilities, with sensory disabilities, with mental health issues, with physical disabilities, and often their needs uh, and their demands are quite different. However, unfortunately, what is a common ground is the, the exclusion from society. Then there's the issue of invisibility um, very often, there are no powerful lobbies or politicians who would be um, supporting this initiative. So that should also be changed in the future. And then uh, two other issues. Um, often people simply think that uh, persons with disabilities, they are passive citizens. How would they be able to uh, raise their voice? Uh, and so this, uh, the, we also have to fight for the change in societal attitudes, but uh, by showing that this is not the case. And lastly, as a historian, uh, I would mention other obstacles, and that is the lack of historical sources. Um, archives were very often not interested uh, in documentation, in accepting documentation about the history of persons with disabilities. So we also have to do a lot for creating more inclusive archives so that these sources do not get lost, do not get thrown out simply because they are not deemed important. Now, uh, starting the first half of my talk, um, I would like to show a few um, milestones in the history of uh, memorization. Uh, and one of them is uh, related to the First World War. Um, clearly, the First World War, because it created so many disabled veterans worldwide, um, was a very, uh, very important point 
uh, in the history of disability. Uh, we have um, across Europe um, very many uh, monuments dedicated to uh, war veterans, but not to my knowledge to um, disabled veterans. However, when um, uh, sources remain silent, um, we can turn to the realm of art, because artists often have a um, very powerful capacity uh, to portray uh, societal problems. And so the first image I, I would like to show is uh, a painting by the German painter Otto Dix, who was himself a soldier in the First World War and who saw all the horror of the war. This painting is called The Match Cellar. It's from 1920, and it shows um, a disabled war veteran, you know, without limbs. He's wearing uh, black uh, glasses, dark glasses, which suggests that he also lost his sight, he's blind. He's trying to sell matches, um, but we see also people um, in exaggerated form who are running away from him. And on top of everything, we also see a dog, a dog urinating on his uh, stump. So uh, all this is a symbol uh, of the tragic fate of disabled war veterans, uh, war veterans in Germany and beyond. Uh, once after they had returned from the front, uh, they were still celebrated for a short time uh, as heroes, and then very quickly they were forgotten. Uh, and many of them had to lead a life as beggars or match, uh, match sellers or uh, in some other um, really humiliating situation. The second image uh, I would like to show, and I'm not going to go into the details because my colleague in the next presentation will surely talk about this, uh, is uh, a memorial uh, about the Second World War. Um, and about the Holocaust. And the only point that I would like to make uh, is that um, even in uh, the memory policies, uh, disabled persons are often the last ones to be included. Uh, here uh, on the PowerPoint slide, you see four monuments, uh, all uh, in Berlin, and all are Holocaust monuments. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, created in 2005, uh, five, that's the most famous one, it's dedicated to the uh, Jewish people. Uh, three years later, um, another monument was erected uh, to uh, the LGBTQI community. Um, in 2012, um, the third monument, uh, this is a pond to the Roma and Shinti people. And in 2014, the last one of these four, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, blue plexiglass that you can see was uh, dedicated to uh, uh, disabled people. And I think it, it is quite telling that uh, what we know about, of course, the history of the Second World War and the Holocaust is that disabled per, uh, people were the first to be killed um, in fact, they were a test case uh, for the future um, uh, killings, but they were the last to receive a place in memory policies. And when we look at these four uh, memorials, um, uh, the one dedicated to disabled people had the lowest budget. So it also shows something about uh, hierarchies and uh, practices. Now, um, another type of uh, Memori memorization uh, is um, uh, dedicated to so-called famous people. And I think there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, heroes uh, deserve to be uh, memorialized. Um, however, it's also important to go beyond that uh, hero category. And what I'm showing here is a very uh, specific case. Um, this is um, the monument of Louis Braille. Uh, in the Pantheon in Paris. And uh, I thought of including this because uh, Louis Braille is known to everyone. Uh, he was born in 1809, uh, close to Paris in a village, and he lost his sight uh, uh, at home as a child in, a, in an accident. 
And uh, what he became so famous for is that he developed a tactile writing system uh, to be used by blind people. Um, and this uh, really revo uh, revolutionized uh, the life of uh, many blind people because it helped them to get out of their isolation. Now, in 1952, this was the um, uh, century uh, anniversary of uh, Bry's death. And he was initially buried uh, in his home village, close to Paris. But on this occasion, on his birthday, his remains were moved to the Pantheon um, in Paris. Uh, and this is the greatest honor that a French citizen can get. So he is there together with figures such as Voltaire or Victor Hugo. And um, on this occasion, another so-called famous uh, disabled person, Helen Keller, the American educator and author who was blind and deaf, gave a speech. And in this speech, uh, she compared um, uh, Rui Bry's legacy uh, to Gutenberg. So um, uh, again, here we have um, a person who is famous, who revolutionized um, re um, uh, a writing system for uh, disabled people. But this is, of course, a very um, uh, exceptional case. Yet another um, case of memorization, it's a quite contested one. Uh, is a relatively recent uh, monument uh, that that you see on the top, but the the history of this goes back uh, to the 1960s, uh, and this is a monument dedicated to certain victims, but this is a monument that was created without the consent or without even asking uh, this group of people whether they need a monument whether this is the monument that they need or whether they need something else. Uh, this is the so-called Kontergen monument in West Germany. And this is dedicated to the victims of uh, Kontergen or uh, Thalodomide. Uh, uh, this was a medication uh, offered in Europe in the 1960s to women for morning sickness, although this was never tested on uh, pregnant women. And uh, you see the medication in the middle um, of the slide, and it resulted in thousands of malformations, um, uh, children born without limbs, and also miscarriages in the 1960s. Um, and there was a criminal trial against uh, Grunenthal, uh, the pharmaceutical company in 1968, uh, but there was no finding of guilt. Uh, the company ag ag agreed to offer some kind of compensation uh, to the people who were affected, but this was not satisfactory. And then in 2012, this monument was unveiled, which uh, shows two chairs. Um, in the first chair, we see um, a little girl with missing limbs and damaged uh, legs. And in the second chair, uh, uh, we see no one. It's left empty to... Uh, commemorate the deaths arising from the Contergan scandal. Uh, I will not comment on the aesthetic um, sides of the aesthetic value of or the lack of the aesthetic value because this is not my point. Uh, my point is, as I mentioned, that this monument was not created with the consent of consultation uh, of the Contergan victims. Um, what they wanted instead was not, so they didn't want the monument, they, they wanted support because as they grow older, no one expected them uh, to uh, uh, reach such a such a so-called old age, a mature age, uh, they would need more support for their everyday life and they don't need this monument. So in, uh, uh, in the bottom um, a photo, you see uh, three protesters. Uh, in German, they, they, they are carrying a banner which says Wirtz Denkmal. And I have to explain this pun because uh, Denkmal is the word for monument in German. Wirtz is the founder of this pharmaceutical company. And Denkmal um, means uh, in, in this um, version as a verb, think about it, think over it. So it's a critical call. Um, uh, address to the pharmaceutical company 
uh, to rethink this policy, which uh, is actually not suiting uh, the uh, needs of the victims. It's just paying lip service uh, to the needs of the victims. So um, these are uh, the type of monuments uh, that, uh, that are more typical. And I'm now turning to the second part of my presentation, because here I would really like to make a call. I would like to invite the community of historians, uh, scholars in memory studies, civil society organizations, and of course, uh, first and foremost, uh, persons with disabilities, to think together about new memory practices uh, to commemorate uh, the social movement of uh, persons with disabilities, which uh, started in the 1970s uh, across Europe. And uh, before uh, showing some images about this, I would also like to give the background to this uh, social movement. Um, so uh, one of the important uh, backgrounds was the Cold War because uh, there was a systemic competition between capitalist and socialist um, societies and, and uh, governments as to which one is uh, caring better for the disabled uh, people. Uh, of course, very often this was, even if there was some care, this was done in a very patronizing way. The other background is the expansion of the welfare state in much of Europe, including even the communist bloc um, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, why is this important? Because the majority of society, uh, most of the groups really benefited from the expansion of the welfare state. Uh, for instance, many more people can get, could get education, they could go to university, they could, go, they could travel to have holidays, which was perhaps earlier on uh, impossible or not, over, not affordable. But then in, in the 1970s, uh, the financial crisis hit, the oil crisis, uh, and in most countries, this meant the rollback of the welfare state. It, it meant budget cuts. And politicians keep telling uh, their constituencies that, well, uh, dear citizens, you have to understand that until now, your living standards improved, but now we have to put a break on this, and you have to accept that there will be some limitations. And the question is why this made, of course, everyone angry, but especially disabled people became very angry because they were left out of the expansion of the welfare state. Those opportunities, going to university, uh, going for a holiday, were not uh, available for them because they, many of them were not even able to leave their apartments. Uh, the streets were not accessible. Uh, there was no opportunity um, for work. So their anger was uh, very, uh, understandable because um, uh, they had to, uh, the, these restrictions uh, also apply to them, but without the previous um, um, new opportunities. And as I will mention, this frustration uh, and anger was a very creative, very fruitful frustration because something new uh, emerged out of it. Now, um, uh, the social movements of persons with disabilities was also inspired and received um, a lot of impetus from the other social movements, such as uh, women, LGBTQ community, the civil rights movement. Um, and there was another um, issue that, that triggered uh, the social movement. Um, the, so the abuses in uh, mental hospitals, in, uh, in uh, social care homes, uh, it turned out that this was, uh, these were actually, these abuses were actually quite systemic. Um, and very often when those abuses were uncovered and brought to the light, uh, for the very first time, there was a discussion uh, uh, in parliament about uh, these issues, whereas earlier on, they were just marginalized, and uh, in high politics, um, people with disabilities could hardly ever be mentioned. And so for this new social movement, um, also a change, a shift was necessary from the so-called medical model of disability to the social model of disability. What do I mean by this? 
Now, according to the medical model of disability, the problem, the so-called problem uh, with disabled persons is their impairment. That, you know, they are not able to walk or they are not able to uh, do certain things. So this is seen as an individual deficit and um, as it's something, it's a lack that has to be improved, that has to be rehabilitated, that has to be fixed. So um, the, the problem, so to speak, is in parentheses, is uh, identified with the individual. But according to the social model of disability, um, the disability itself is a societal construct. Because let's think of uh, someone who uses a wheelchair. Uh, if this person is not able to get from A to B uh, in any city, according to the social model, the problem is not the person's impairment, that maybe uh, he cannot use his legs. The problem is that the street is not made accessible. So it is society's um, uh, uh, responsibility uh, to uh, cater for this uh, more accessible environment and in that environment, um, this particular problem uh, will no longer be a problem. So, as I mentioned, um, the anger uh, of um, uh, disabled people and their allies, who could be parents, who could be friends, who could be teachers, uh, it produced a wave of protests across uh, much of Western Europe in the 1970s and also 1980s. Uh, I also have to mention that in Eastern Europe, in communist Eastern Europe, uh, perhaps there were, there were no comparable protests on the street, but there were also protests in a more uh, subtle form. So this is also a European phenomenon. This is, uh, this is a pan-European phenomenon. And I could give um, an entire talk uh, about these protests, but here uh, this is not our aim. So I only chose uh, two images, uh, um, and these are uh, showing protests that were taking place in 1960, 1976 in November in Spain after the uh, fall of the Franco regime. Uh, I would also like to mention that I am aware that such protests were also taking place in Catalonia. Uh, only unfortunately I wasn't uh, able to find images but I would like to encourage the students, uh, history students of the University of Barcelona to go to the archives and to find the sources because I'm sure that there's very rich uh, documentation. So what were these protests about? Um, as I mentioned, um, so generally speaking about societal inclusion, uh, which, is, which often meant simply to be able to get to the street but uh, in a more advanced form, it also, mean, it also meant working opportunities. Uh, so it meant actually getting similar opportunities uh, to the so-called uh, able-bodied citizens. And as you see on the photos, uh, all this was accommodated uh, within the context of social justice. Uh, fighting for the rights of persons with disabilities is a very important matter of social justice and it will remain so also in the future. Now, um, on my last slide, um, I would like to show three images. Uh, we are today used to color for impressive images, so we might have to exercise our eyes to be um, able to get the meaning out of these uh, images. Uh, but I think that they are very telling because they show something very important about the agency uh, of uh, disabled people, which is often overlooked, both in history uh, and also in other disciplines. And these images uh, relate to the United Nations International Youth of Disabled Persons, uh, which was organized in 1981 and about which I had a major research project. Now, uh, why is this year so interesting? Uh, because it was a top-down event. It was organized by the UN and by the governments uh, in almost every country in the world. But it was organized in such a way that, again, it, it didn't suit the needs of uh, the grassroots initiatives of uh, disabled people. And so on these three images, I would start with the one on the left-hand side. 
uh, we see a more senior uh, person uh, dressed very elegantly in a, in a uh, black suit. And this person is uh, no uh, other uh, person than the, federal, uh, the president of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1981, uh, Karl Karstens. The other person we see is quite angry in the white uh, shirt and uh, he's uh, on crutches. Um, he's a disability activist and I would also like to name him, he's Franz Christoph. Because in this way, you know, we are making sure that not only the presidents are being named and recorded in memory, but also the disability activists. And I would like to give uh, the background to what happens on this image, uh, because it doesn't capture it fully. So we are in 1981 uh, at a big event, a rehabilitation fair in the city of Düsseldorf. And allegedly, this event is um, for disabled people, about their needs. But it becomes very uh, clear at the very beginning that this is, again, just lip service. This is just pretending that they are interested in these needs. For example, for this event, which uh, uh, was a two-day event, um, the building was made accessible for wheelchair users. And they also installed um, uh, toilets that could be used by disabled people. But at the moment the event was over, they planned to remove the ramps. They planned to remove the, uh, these toilets. So it really meant, it really showed that no one thought about seriously and in a more structural way about uh, accessibility. So uh, all this and many other comparable incidents uh, made this disability activist so angry that he approached the, federal, the president of the Federal Republic and he, we cannot see this on the image, but he very likely hit him or maybe touched is a better word on his head. Can you imagine this happening? Uh, an angry activist on crutches touches uh, the, the president with his crutch on the head. And so the question might be what happened after this incident? Well, uh, actually nothing much happened. Um, uh, Franz Christoph, the activist, was asked to leave the room, which made him even angrier than uh, he was already, because he said, if I was an able-bodied citizen, if I had no disability, I would have been arrested immediately for insulting the president. So I demand to be arrested because that's the only way I'm treated uh, uh, in an equal way. So you see that there's, there was also a sense of humor. It, uh, you know, activism requires this sense of humor and we had it there. The image in the middle, um, it's also, unfortunately the quality is not the best, but hopefully you can see um, a young a girl with his helper in a wheelchair and the girl has um, a yellow star on her um, uh, top, on her pullover. Uh, and there is also a very good reason for why the legacy of uh, the Holocaust is evoked in this way. This is um, a photo from a protest that took place in the city of Frankfurt. And this protest was triggered by a really scandalous uh, judgment of um, a local court. Uh, what was this um, story about? Um, it was a, a story about a, an elderly lady, German lady, who took a vacation, booked a vacation uh, via um, a travel agency and traveled to Greece and spent two weeks in Greece. And when she came back, uh, she um, complained to the travel agency that her holiday was entirely ruined and entirely spoiled because in the same hotel, there were, I cite, 25 physically and mentally seriously disabled Swedish guests. And she claimed that this was a huge psychological strain on her, that she had to see them, look at them every day and this spoiled her vacation, and the, uh, she wanted her money back. Now, to everyone's shock, the judge ruled 
that she was right in 1980. So this was actually in the run-up for the International, International Year of Disabled Persons. The judge claimed that, uh, the judge said that it is undeniable that, you know, tragedy exists in the world, but someone on a vacation cannot be forced to be confronted this every day. And this was a judgment that launched an enormous protest uh, in the city. Thousands of people demonstrated, both uh, disabled and their friends and their allies. And you will not be surprised that the question that they asked, okay, so if people who have some disabilities, they have to be left out of sight because they are disturbing others, where do we draw the line? Should both people also not be leaving their homes because some some people don't like the sight of uh, hairless people? So uh, this again brought back the very painful legacy of the euthanasia policies. You know when citizens were singled out just for being different. And the final image um, is also um, uh, I hope it's still visible for you, but if not, I will read it out. This is just a graffiti. But uh, with this, I would also like to show that uh, for historians, even a graffiti on a firewall is a very, very important document. And this is, uh, the language is English, so you see that this is from Britain. It is a protest, an individual protest of um, someone who wrote on the wall uh, about this year, it might be your year for the disabled, for me, it's the rest of my life. So this once again shows that uh, everyone knew that one year full of these uh, celebrations, which were uh, often causing uh, scandals rather than suggesting uh, way forward and solutions, um, uh, this was um, really uh, problematic. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, it was also very significant because the anger that it created uh, it really paved the way for new policies, for a new way of thinking, uh, including a human rights-based um, understanding of disability, uh, which is now uh, part of the United Nations Convention. So I would like to conclude my talk uh, by making a call, by inviting everyone, members of the public, um, scholars, students, I would also like to appeal to the young generation because young people very often can come up with new ideas, new solutions, uh, new um, uh, digital methods. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask us to think together about new ways of memorization that portray uh, persons with disabilities not only and not necessarily either as victims, or superheroes, but as every as engaged everyday citizens uh, who have the agency and the power to change their own life situations. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for the attention. Well, thank you, Professor Ba, for your enlightening presentation. Um, now we have time for the Q&A, for questions and answers with the audience. If uh, any of you have uh, any questions, the public We will need a mic for the questions and answers you can ask in English or in Catalan and in Spanish. Please, microphone, otherwise Professor will not hear us. Hello and good morning. First of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. And I would like to also acknowledge the importance of memory and disabilities. Mm, disabilities somehow are sometimes internal. Of course, my disabilities are visible, but other disabilities are not visible. Here in Barcelona, there is an important movement of people with disabilities. And it's quite a pity that 
there are no representatives from these entities in the conference, only me. It is a pity because I believe that history has to be built, not only memory, right? We have to be part of history. Professor, you mentioned that there are, I mean, that you haven't found documents from Catalonia. Yeah, here in Catalonia, there has always been an important movement for, of people with disabilities from 1968 onwards. Nonetheless, from 1968 to 1977 or 79, well, it was this period when there was an important boom, an important explosion in the movement of people with handicap. And these people were claiming for jobs and no charity. And let me put it in Spanish because back then, Catalan could not be used because we were amidst the Franco dictatorship. So considering that we had nothing to lose, those of us with disabilities and nothing to lose marched the streets and we were badly hit by the police. We even participated in a lockdown and we were not evicted. We occupied the Ministry of Work, the former CRM, for three months. So this is quite a remarkable story. Now, in Barcelona and in Catalonia in general, also in Spain, but mainly in Barcelona and in Catalonia, well, in Spain, there's ONCE, the National Organization for Blind People. They have a lot of money, so they have contributed a great deal to the rights of blind people, right? But except for that, well, here we have the National Institute or rather the Municipal Institute of People with Disabilities here in Barcelona. And we believe it is the only entity at the global level that appoint a representative by universal suffrage every four years. So people with disabilities directly, we do not let anyone speak on our behalf. We represent ourselves. Here in Barcelona, there are more than 65,000 people with disabilities. We have counted them. In many places, there is no census on the amount of people with disabilities. So if there's no data, there's no way to measure things and to know what is going on. And then there is here in Barcelona a municipal code of accessibility that was adopted and is legally binding. So now people with disabilities can sue the municipal government and all private entities when this code is not observed. And again, I would like to say that it's very weird that it's only me here. I've been an activist all my life, but of course I've done other things throughout my life, right? My life has not been limited to being an activist or to pretending to be what others expect about me, right? I wanted to have my own agency and I wanted to be the main character of my own life. I hope I'm making myself clear. Uh, having said that, I have to move on. I mean, life goes on and I have to systematically lay on the table my rights, claim for my rights. And, you know, this takes an effort, whereas people who are not disabled have this for granted. And I have to say that I developed my disability later in my life, so I really understand the difference between having a disability a disability and not having one, or a visible one or an invisible one, right? Mine is visible. So I celebrate, I embrace this gathering and this meeting. Thank you very much. But again, here, this morning, as I stepped into this building, I thought, okay, this is an historical building, a very old building, and today it was impossible to cross the front door. Not because there is a barrier, an architectonic barrier. The barrier has been set up, right? Today, <laughs> there is is a large door, a massive door that you have to push to get in. And I can't. This door should always be open. What a pity. It's not open. But you know, there is a clear lack of education, a clear lack of awareness when it comes to accessibility. So, as I am used to do, I've had to take an alternative path. Of course, I made it all the way up here. I'm here because I have set an agency and I know to, you know, find my way around. But I was 15 minutes late and I've missed part of your presentation because I was traveling around the building. So again, I would like to call your attention on that. If you really want to contribute to our memory, we have to be part of the process because it's not going to be you speaking on our behalf, right? 
Life, our life belongs to us, so we need to be us representing ourselves and if you really want to you know gather our memory ask people with disabilities because there are more than 165,000 of us here in Barcelona and everywhere of course and again please listen listen and some of us even write <laughs> so what you said, Professor, is extremely clever, and of course, everything you said is extremely thought-provoking, but what I'm surprised about is that there are no people with disabilities who is part of this project, right, with a name and a family name, because, of course, we are also allowed to have descendants. I have two daughters and two granddaughters. Of course, there is a great deal of pressure on us not reproducing ourselves or not having sex, right? Women, my age, oh my gosh, it's totally unthinkable for us to have an active sexual life. And many times, I've been, I mean, many doctors have suggested me to uh, perform a sterilization on me. I've also been a lecturer. There was even a bill against us being a lecturer. I was a lecturer in a high school for 30 years. Now I've, yeah, I know I'm kind of showing off now, but it's not all about showing off. It's just that you do, I mean, your life is, has been quite similar to mine, but without disabilities or visible disabilities. I've, I've done nothing exceptional. You know, if today I could have accessed the main door, probably I wouldn't have taken the floor. But, you know, see, my life has been all about claiming for equal rights. Even silly rights are just accessing the main door. And your, our memory belongs to us, as your memory belongs to you. I mean, memory is heterogeneous and we have to be part of our memory description right and of course everything you've said is very important because you know we like living we're happy to live we are taking our place our time and you know when our life is over no one knows what happens next so we are all equal and we came here to enjoy life again thanks a million and perhaps if someone could tell me why there's no one with disabilities in this project thank you May I react? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for these comments. Uh, I think, um, as you mentioned, sometimes disabilities are not visible. So uh, perhaps there are still people in the room or among the speakers, but you don't see them. But more importantly, I would like to thank you very, very much for your comments because it shows that um, uh, disability rights, it's a work in progress. Uh, and it also has to do with awareness raising. Uh, we all must become aware uh, of these issues. Uh, but more, even more important, uh, even just uh, as important, it is for me as a historian that your experiences, they do not get lost. And because of this, I would like to call anyone in the audience who is associated with the University of Barcelona or with an other university or with an NGO or a civil society organization, please encourage students, especially students of history, to choose topics uh, that are relevant for this uh, uh, aim uh, as dissertation projects because in that context, interviews can be done uh, and the first steps can be undertaken uh, for this inclusion also, not only in society, but also in memory policies. Thank you very much. I have a mental, uh, a mental disability. And I always say that people with mental disabilities are very little represented. Why? Because we're oftentimes working. <laughs> we're working and we're trying to, you know, pay our bills. Because social entities, social organizations, for which we work, do not give us free time to attend conferences. 
know the politicians and decision makers ask about our needs. We have been discriminated, for example, even within disability movements, you know, decision makers adopt the bills and we are working, working hard. And we have no time to attend demonstrations because it's difficult for us. It's always in Barcelona. Uh, you know, everything is centralized in Barcelona. So if you don't live in Barcelona, it's even worse. And of course, we need money, like everyone. My brother, for example, also has a disability. And we are, you know, always uh, working. And this is the main problem, because when there's a workshop or a seminar, for us, it's very difficult to attend it, because perhaps it will take us more time, and we're working. And as you said before, of course, who protest in the street? Well, those who are in a better off situation, not those of us who are working in a center for people with disabilities. So it's a negative circle, I would say. Hello and good morning. In the afternoon session, we will be listening to many people with disabilities. My name is Maite, and I am the president of LALAT. LALAT is an organization of families, or is an organization of relatives of people with disabilities. I believe it is very important to understand the situation of families with children with mental disabilities, or descendants with mental disabilities who have very little capacity to defend their rights, right? Because, wow, this is a hot topic. I hope in the afternoon we'll discuss the topic. If you can use the mic, please. Just a minor comment. Why hasn't the conference been broadcasted online? This also grants accessibility. <laughs> this is perhaps a minor question, but you know, for many people with disabilities, the session is recorded, is being recorded, and in a couple of weeks, everything will be uploaded into the website. Yeah, but live participation perhaps would be better. So it's a recommendation to, you know, broadcast this session live. We're running late-ish, so if we can move on and give a floor to one last person. This would be amazing. I have several remarks. Yeah, of course, online is good, but having a webinar online doesn't mean that people with disabilities will further participate because society wants us, wants us to be hidden, not to see us. So, you know, I have my... And perhaps a little bit reluctant to saying that being online means being, being let's say, part of our society. Of course, technology is help. I would like to answer you. You are an activist. Well, of course, in order to be an activist, because, you know, if you have a disability, you have to be an activist. There's no other way around it. And, you know, when you are an activist, you need to be out in the street. And, you know, if you have to work and you want to attend a protest, lie, tell your boss you are ill and go to the protest. Don't be a good child and then expect others to fight for you. It, this is not going to happen. Of course, there are rights on paper, thanks to the United Nations conventions, but you need to be there. You need to be in the street. Of course, a special work center is a sort of prison. You need to find a job somewhere else because these places are not the best place to work and salaries are very low, so I encourage you to find another job. I would like to also say that in the in in the Municipal Institute of People with Handicap, those who represent people with handicap before the City Council, well, there's a group of 10 of us, 62% with people, I mean, uh, it, uh, there's a percentage of people with physical disabilities, mental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, 
another person with sight disabilities and hearing disabilities. So there is a wide representation here in Barcelona. And what we need to do when it comes to the legal framework is to make sure that we are part of the process. Of course, it's difficult. We need a certain degree of expertise, of course, to be part of the legal process. Of course, there are some bills, the bill on equality, non-discrimination, the bill on uh, eradication of all forms of violence. Of course, we participated in the bill, but now it has to be implemented because no one remembers anymore that the bill includes articles that defend us, so there is very little knowledge amongst lawyers, judges, so there is a great deal of work ahead, incredible, an immense work ahead. But again, we need to be more literate regarding our legal framework, the legal framework that defends and defend us, sorry. And of course, we need to be active and we need to be engaged at the political level. And I would like to say that I'm the president of an organization. I don't know if anyone knows me, but we have a... Well, our organization also has a research branch and we have quite a lot of material, so rich us. We have quite a lot of documentation of literature on capacitism and other interesting research lines. Little by little, we are accumulating interesting research. So thanks. Thanks for your attention. Any other comment, remark? If this was a seminar to protest, well, I think Barcelona is quite an accessible uh, city. I know yet you mentioned about the door and the problems getting into the building. But I think Barcelona is quite an accessible uh, city compared to other Spanish cities when we talk about architectural barriers. We are here, but here it's not like a protest uh, seminar. This is why I was talking about doing it online. I know you, we've met. If I had, if the seminar had been organized online, I'm sure that more people would have participated. I belong to an organization teaching online, and thanks to that, people are learning for free, and they can access later on to the university. And this was the, my remark. I think if this seminar had been organized online, it would have been perfect. And I insist, if this had been a protest seminar or a protest event, 100% in person, I agree with you, but that's not a protest seminar. Thank you to all of you for your remarks. Um, we're very happy that this looking to the past will help us to create debate about our current situation and look into the future. Uh, it will be a honor to have you in Barcelona next time and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye. Now we have a coffee break. We can have some coffee outside and we'll come back in 25 minutes at 11.30 for the next session. Thank you.